I just passed my 107 exam. I got an 83%. Just walked out of the testing center here at the Lancaster Airport here in Linnitz, PA. And I uh, just wanted to share a couple of my, the things that tripped me up. I spent a lot of time preparing for this, probably more than I needed to. And I don't have any kind of history with aviation or anything like that, but I've been flying drones for a long time. But when it came to the actual knowledge that you need to study for this test, a lot of it was all new to me. And I spent, um, it's just a little history or how I prepped and what I did. But I, I did spend several days, a um, couple hours each day, like maybe over the course of two weeks preparing. I watched, you know, the, the popular videos on YouTube, even though they were kind of dated. Um, the more I studied, the more I heard that you're supposed to check out the new stuff. And yes, I did eventually, but I'll get to that. I watched those videos, the first watch through, you know, the better B-roll one. And I can't remember that dude's name with the white hair. Um, I watched them the whole way through while taking notes. And then I listened to them at least one more time each and then, you know, reviewed the notes sometimes. And then I started taking some practice tests and taking the practice tests over and over and over again. I know that can lead to memorization, um, which isn't the best thing because you're supposed to retain, you know, the actual knowledge to be able to apply it to different wordings and whatnot. But uh, for me, at least, uh, the memorization does help me because the more I memorize that stuff, the more I learn it and then I can apply it and see different wordings. But I think one of the things that helped me the most is finding a good practice test. And I'll have to add a link in the description. I know it was something King's, uh, King's practice test. I liked this pra practice test because it wasn't too you know, annoying about trying to sell me something. Really didn't want to buy anything. And also it has a huge test bank that is randomized each time. So this, I didn't see many repeat questions too frequently. And even it is, it is a paid course that you can go into, but with the way this practice exam works on Kings, the way I spent most of my time actually studying and not watching videos, the, the first question on this practice test that's randomly generated will generate an explanation as to why the certain response was correct and why the other ones were incorrect. But it only does that for the first question. So I kind of exploited that by taking the test over and over and over again, but only taking question number one to get that explanation. And then I was, I literally just screenshotted the explanation with all the answer choices and the incorrect explanations as well. Collected all those screenshots. I think I collected about 150 of them and I st still was coming up with new questions. And this King's practice test also had some of the new content on night flying operations over people and remote ID in there as well. Not many, but there were some in there. So that kind of led me to believe that the test bank questions w were recently updated by King's or whoever it is that runs that. Then I printed all those out, read those over like a book, marked them up, kept reading them, traded some flashcards off of that. And really I spent 80% of my time studying, maybe even 90, going over those test questions that I printed with the written explanations as to correct answers and incorrect answers, all generated from that first question only. That was the key. Just taking one question and then submitting. You know, you get a score of 1.7% for your practice test, but I was only after that explanation. So spending some time here talking about that because that I honestly feel that is what gave me the confidence and the knowledge that I needed to get an 83% on the actual 107 exam. So with that said, um, talking about my experience with the exam, I just took it, you know, 20 minutes ago. It took me about 40, 40 minutes to get through it. I, it seems fast, but I felt pretty good about it. And I didn't end up bookmarking too many questions. I did go back and look, but I didn't end up changing any answers because I feel like I would have screwed myself if I would have done that. So I want to go over this, the things that I can at least recall because, you know, as soon as you leave that testing center and you get your score, especially if you pass, you kind of start drawing a blank and that stuff leaves pretty quick. But the, the topics that I do remember, there were several questions that asked about ADS-B. I, I looked over the new stuff, uh, night flying, uh, flying over people and remote ID and even like the drone categories of one, two, three, and four. I read about those. But this ADS-B came up in like at least two questions. And I have a feeling that that was the right answer, but I didn't select it because I'd never seen it. And I felt like I would have at least heard it or come across it once. 
So you'll have to look that up on your own um, to see if that's actually a thing. If it is, I just completely missed it. Um, I, I got another question that had, it was kind of a tricky one that I ended up catching during the exam. And it, it was a question about a tower and how, fly, how high you can fly over top of the tower, which, you know, the, over the top of the obstacle you can add, you can do 400 feet AGL plus the additional height of the obstacle that you're flying over. I, I remember that from studying. But this one, it was measuring an AGL and the obstacle, which happened to be a tower, on the sectional charts had a number on top of another number next to this tower. And you had to know which one was MSL and which one was AGL. So the, the number on top would have been mean sea level and then the number on the bottom was AGL. So MSL on top, AGL on bottom. And you had to add 400 to the AGL height. So that would have been 400 added to the number on the bottom of that. So there, the answer responses were all super close, and yes, the MSL calculation was an answer choice, and thankfully I knew that, and that was in the chart supplement too. So I did end up going back just to confirm that the bottom number was AGL, and of course it was, but had I not known that or thought to check, I would have gotten that one wrong because some people might automatically go to the top number because it's right there and it's biggest or whatever, and just be careful of that one. So look out for ADS-B, keep an eye out for the MSL AGL differences. There were several night flight questions, probably about three um, operations at night. The one that I recall the most, kind of, I ended up going with my gut on it, but it said uh, you're preparing for a night flight and you take a pre-flight during daylight hours. So it's like the evening before nighttime and you do a pre-flight leading up to your night flight. And it said, how can you prepare your eyes to maximize safety, essentially. And, and um, one of the options was to use like big lights. So when you do fly at night, you have huge lights everywhere. I don't think that was the right answer. The other option, um, something about staring directly at the drone. That seemed stupid, so I didn't choose that. And the other one said use sunglasses or glasses with a neutral, neutral de density filter. So ND filters in your sunglasses or glasses or whatever, something like that. And that kind of made sense to me because it would reduce the amount of light going into your eyes and help your eyes adjust. Now, what I remember from my studies was that it takes your eyes 30 minutes to adjust to darkness or whatever. So like to fully adjust 30 minutes. That wasn't the question. So, um, yeah, I went with the ND filters on the glasses. I actually don't even know if that was right or not, but hopefully it was. And you've probably seen... If you've been studying things about ventilation, which is, or I'm sorry, hyperventilation, which is when you breathe too fast. And the question wasn't, you know, what is hyperventilation or what, when you breathe too fast, what is it? The question was worded like, what can hyperventilation cause? So I hadn't seen it worded that way, which I kind of expected this going into the exam that I wasn't expecting to see the exact same question wordings as on the practice exams because it's supposed to give you an idea of what you need to know and then you get the knowledge and then you can answer any kind of wording supposedly. So hyperventilation can cause and one of them was um, a lack of oxygen. That's what, the, that's what the answer that I went with. A lack of oxygen because you know you're breathing too much, exhaling, not taking as many inhales and you can expel oxygen, I suppose, that way. So that's kind of what I went with. I can't really recall what the other ones were. Um, it might have been nausea and maybe fatigue or something like that. It was just kind of symptom kinds of things. But I went with lack of oxygen. And the only other one that I remember about hyperventilation, I did get two questions on it. Um, it was the description, talking about breathing too fast. And it said what, what condition is caused, or can breathing too fast cause? And I do remember it said hyperventilation and also hypoventilation. So make sure you know that it's hyper with ER and not hypo. So I'm pretty sure that's just about it. Um, but yeah, again, I didn't pay for anything. Um, I didn't pay any courses. I got an 83% of my, it was my first try. So I really recommend to anyone that is prepping or thinking about starting to get ready for this exam, Check out that practice test at King's. I'll put a link in the description and uh, remember just to take, I mean, take the whole thing several times. That's not gonna hurt. But after I got really familiar with it, 
I started just doing that first question and submit to get, you know, the the explanation, and then screenshotting and printing and, and studying that way. Get all, I basically collected all of their answer bank along with all of their descriptions that typically would be a part of their paid course where you have access to all of that for every question on every practice run. Um, I just kind of found a little bit of a loophole with it that, that helped me. Hopefully it can help you and um, you can get your exam as well, can, can pass it and get your certificate and start flying legally and doing some commercial work, which is what I'm excited to do. So hopefully you get some more of that coming into the channel here as I start doing um, commercial operations for construction, real estate, um, or really literally anything else, but I'm going to be doing a lot of FPV work. Um, I plan on doing Mavic work and just some flyby stuff or overhead, but I, that kind of stuff honestly bores me a little bit. So um, I'm going to focus more on the FPV and doing some more um, complex work, indoor exterior stuff too. And then um, hopefully we'll see how that goes. And I'm hoping that it turns out to be something that I enjoy that I can, oh geez, let's uh, do full time sometime. That'd be amazing. So anyway, yeah, that's pretty much it. Check them out. Uh, check out the links in the descriptions for some of the resources that I that I used. And uh, good luck out there. And um, hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks.